Last few days that I have been here when I've been speaking, I've been talking about the righteousness of Christ, and I'd like to make a little confession to you. These studies that I've been sharing are not originally my own. I mean, they've been tweaked and I've done some work with them, but these are based fundamentally from the studies that E.J. Wagoner gave at the 1888 Minneapolis Conference. They were codified in his book, Christ Our Righteousness, also published under the title Christ and His Righteousness, and also The Righteousness of Christ. But they're fundamental lessons taken from the scriptures. And I think I mentioned a text to you in Philippians chapter 3 the other day. I'd like to turn to that text again. I don't have a slide for it, but that's okay. In Philippians chapter 3 and verse 1, Paul says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord to write the same things to you. To me, indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Sometimes we take a, a, a piece of a picture puzzle and we look at that picture, that little piece. And that little piece may be clear of itself, but it really doesn't come to significance until it's put together with the other pieces and we can step back and see the larger picture. Does that make sense? So tonight or today, we're talking about Christ's righteousness. What is the standard of his righteousness? And then the way to that righteousness, amen? Because it's not enough just to know the righteousness. We need to know how to obtain the righteousness. And I would like to suggest to you that his righteousness is a far greater, a far higher standard than we've been led to normally believe. Uh, I've, I've put this presentation into a, into a Bible study. It's a question and answer Bible study. I, I won't be doing a lot of preaching per se, but what we're going to do, we're going to have a question. And can you all see the, the screen okay? Is it clear enough to see in the back? Is the writing big enough if you at that size? Can you see it? Okay. So, you know, Jesus says, well, let me just say this. So we all have priorities. And when it comes to our money, where should our priority be? The work of God. And you know, the Bible says that we are to take a tithe or our tithe and return to the Lord, right? Now, that tithe, is that is that tithe calculated after I have already met all of my expenses? No, it's calculated first, isn't it? It comes off what we call the top, right? But it's not just tithes, it's tithes and offerings in it several years ago when i was pastoring a church in the Adventist church system our local church had hired a bible worker 
And we had hired him, admittedly, on a sacrificial basis. He didn't get very much. But he was willing to work at this weight, as, at a certain wage. But after a couple of months, he came to me and he said, you know, we had plans on how we could do this financially, but it's getting really hard. And he said, you know, I pay an honest tie that he had to cheat with all the expenses and how much he was getting. And he says, you know, he says, there's just not anything left. I can't give an offering. What should I do? And I said, give one dollar. It may not be much, but give one dollar. Don't come before the Lord empty. Bring him something. It may be all you have. It may be worth more. That one dollar may be worth more to you than hundreds of dollars mean to other people. But bring something. And so in our Christian life, we do have priorities. We have priorities about how we spend our time. We have priorities about how we're going to eat our food. What food should we eat? You know, sometimes we have to make hard decisions. It's true because poverty is a reality. You know, Jesus said, you always have the poor among you. But part of the reason that we have the poor among us is to test those of us who may have more means and make us more liberal and get the selfishness out of us. Because friends, we are all selfish. We're all full of selfishness and the Lord wants to take that from us. And he has given us systematic benevolence because that will starve covetousness to death. And that's what we need. But Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33, there is a burden for seek in this world. In Matthew 33, he says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And he's been speaking about the temporal things, the, the things that we eat, the having shelter over our heads, having clothes that we need. He's been speaking about those things. He says, the Gentiles seek after the things. But in Matthew 6 and verse 33, he says, but you seek after the first thing, the kingdom of God, and his righteousness, and all of those things will be added unto you. Now, we may not get a Mercedes Benz. We might not get a car at all. But the things that are needful will be added to us, he tells us. But we're to seek his kingdom and his righteousness. And I think most of us have an understanding a little bit about the kingdom of God. But what is this righteousness that we are to seek? Because how can we seek something if we really don't know what it is, right? So we need to understand what constitutes righteousness of God and of Christ. So that would be our logical question. We would come, what does really make that standard? And such a simple text in Psalms 119 and verse 172. Can we read this together? Will you help me read this? My tongue shall speak of thy word for all thy commandments are what? Righteousness. He says his commandments are righteousness. Now, the commandments are righteousness. There's no unrighteousness in them. Have you ever heard people say, well, I don't want to keep that old law. I don't want to keep that old law because, you know, that's for the Jews or something. But friends, the commandments are righteousness and righteousness is for everyone, whether we're white, black, red, yellow, Jew, Gentile, you know, barbarian, Scythian or whatever. So then we ask the question, what is in the heart of those who know the righteousness of God? And in Isaiah chapter 51 and verse 7, it says, Hearken unto me, ye that know righteousness, the people in whose heart is my what? My law. Fear ye not the reproach of men, neither ye be afraid of their revelings. But he says that the people who have righteousness... In their heart is God's law. Amen. You know, when we think about this issue of finance, stewardship, all we really need to get a hold of is a person's heart. A heart. If someone is really not returning faithful tithes and offerings, friends, it's not always just a matter of the financial issues not adding up in their ledger for them. It's really an issue that their heart isn't right. Because if their heart is right, they're going to want to do what is right. And the people who have righteousness, God's law is in their hearts. 
Now, there's people who will tell us today that God's law has been done away with. We don't need the Ten Commandments anymore. We live under the reign of the Spirit. Have you ever heard that said? I mean, that's said a lot. But friends, in Psalms 111, in verse 3, it tells us how long God's righteousness will endure. And says his work is honorable and glorious, and his righteousness endureth for how long? Forever. Amen. Do you believe that? Forever. Forever. And so God's righteousness, his standard, is bound up in his commandments. Now, if we think about righteousness, the opposite of that is unrighteousness. And so what is unrighteousness then? In 1 John chapter 5 and verse 17, he says, all unrighteousness is sin. And then he says, and there's a sin not unto death. And someone asked me yesterday down at Nairobi, they said, what is that sin that's not unto death? What do you think the sin that's not unto death is? I thought all sins were pretty serious. What would be the sin that's not unto death? Friends, it's the sin that is confessed and repented of. It's the sin that is confessed and repented of. But friends, the Bible says the wages of sin is death. Now, I had an experience one time several years ago. I told you, I think, or maybe I mentioned it one time that I was a mathematics teacher at one time. But I also had an opportunity to teach driver, driver education. I taught people how to drive their cars. And I, I don't think I ever taught them how to drive in Kenya. That's a fact. Because you all drive a lot differently here. But, um, but we were out in a car with some students one day, and the students were talking about sin. An interesting topic for high school students. And I said, well, what do you think sin is? And someone said, well, you know, sin is like doing wrong. I said, well, that's pretty close. You know, sin is like stealing. It's like killing. It's like committing adultery, right? But those things don't define sin. They are examples of sin. If I asked you, what is an automobile? You might say, well, it's a Toyota or it's a Mercedes. But that's just an example of an automobile, right? So we want to know what the Bible says is sin. And the answer is found in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4. 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. It says, Whosoever committeth sin transgresses also the law, for sin is what? The transgression of the law. Sin is the transgression of the law, friend. That's so plain, it's so clear. Don't get this wrong. Now, within Christianity, there are different subdivisions. For instance, we have Catholicism and Protestantism, right? But theologically, there are different camps of thought concerning salvation. And among Protestants or Protestants, we don't really have too many Protestants anymore. Do you all pronounce that word Protestant or Protestant? Protestant. Well, how many of them are really protesting anymore? You know, you may not realize this, but there was a, there was a conference held in America a little over 100 years ago, and it was by some of these so-called Protestants, and they said, you know, this name Protestant, it's offensive to people like the Catholics, and so we'll modify the way we say this, and so they decided they would start to pronounce it Protestant instead of Protestant. And so in America, what you call a Protestant is called a Protestant. Because we don't protest anymore. But within this area of Protestantism, there are really two main theological areas. There is Calvinism and Arminianism. Calvinism and Arminianism. Let me explain those. Have you ever heard of a man by the name of John Calvin? Was he a really good guy? Was John Calvin a really good guy? Uh, we're not sure, are we, you know? I mean, it's like Martin Luther. He did a lot of good things. And he had some things that weren't so good. But one of the ideas of Calvin was that he he sort of adopted the, the, uh, the view of Augustine or Augustine that you are born a sinner and that sin is your nature. And that theology is very prevalent in most Protestant churches today. There was another man by the name of Jacob Arminius. 
And Armenia said sin is the transgression of the law and that we are born with a fallen nature. We are born with a bent to do wrong, but we are sinners when we commit sin, when we transgress. And the Seventh-day Adventist people, James and Ellen White, Joseph Bates, Loughborough, Andrews, all those pioneers, the Adventist movement was a movement of Armenianism. It was a movement of Armenianism. And we define sin as a transgression of the law. But today, today in most Adventist churches and in even in many of the one true God groups, they have adopted the Calvinistic view of sin. And friends, we cannot endure with that. It will not take us through to the end. Now, just as I said, I used to be a mathematics teacher. And we had this, uh, this idea in algebra that if A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. Maybe you've heard that before. But if unrighteousness is equal to sin, and sin is the transgression of the law, then unrighteousness is simply the transgression of the law. But if we take that and make it into a positive form, it simply says that righteousness is from obedience to the law of God. Now, this idea that sin is something else in the transgression of the law, I just want to share a couple of statements, and there are over 30 direct statements in the spirit of prophecy on this, but I'm going to share two. Ellen White says in Selected Message, book one, page 320, paragraph one, that the only definition we find in the Bible for sin is that sin is the transgression of the law, 1 John 3, 4. She says this is the only definition in the Bible. Now, there are definitions that other people have. That's true but they're not from the Bible. And the question is, are we going to go by what the Bible says or by something else? Here's another statement. This is from Sermons on Talks, Volume 1, page 228.2. It is the privilege of every sinner to ask his teacher what sin really is. Give me a definition of sin. We have one in 1 John 3. Sin is the transgression of the law. Now, this is the what? only definition of sin in the whole bible pretty plain isn't it pretty plain and we need to understand this concept of sin and righteousness so we're talking about the commandments of god all thy commandments are righteousness the commandments are a transcript of god's character and so what law is it which obedience Two is righteousness and disobedience to is sin. Am I talking too fast again? I need to slow down maybe. Romans chapter seven and verse seven. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin. And that's the topic we're talking about here. What sin is and what righteousness is and how to overcome sin, how to have our sins forgiven. I had not known sin, but by the law, for I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shall not covet. Now, in Leviticus chapter 11, there are some dietary laws. Amen? But is that the law that says, Thou shall not covet? No. What law says, Thou shall not covet? The Ten Commandment law. Right. So it's the Ten Commandment law that represents righteousness to us is that law which represents the character of God for us. Now, upon what did the psalmist love to meditate? You know, people, kids today, they love to meditate on all kinds of things, old people too. But notice what the psalmist said here. Oh, how I love, oh, how love I thy law. It is my meditation all the day. All the day. Meditating on the law of God. The great standard that God has for us. It's a high standard. It's a good standard. The Apostle Paul spoke about it. I'm sorry, did I get that right? Here we go. Okay, maybe my slide was wrong. I may have pushed it on, but here we go. Uh, it says, what attribute does Paul give to the Ten Commandment law? And he says, wherefore the law is holy. And the commandment holy and just and good. And that's in Romans chapter 7 and verse 12. Romans 7, 12. So is there anything wrong with God's law? Anything faulty with it? Is it deficient in some way? Is there some way that God's law is not complete? 
you know, we, we had this phrase Decalogue. What does the phrase Decalogue mean? It literally means 10 words, 10 words. But these are the 10 laws of God. And how could you think about this? How could you write these laws simpler? How could you condense? It'd be pretty hard to, wouldn't it? Just impossible. God has put it in the simplest form possible for us. Now, that doesn't mean there's not a depth to that law, okay? And Jesus, he wanted to show us the spirituality of the law. And how did he do that? Well, for instance, in the Sermon on the Mount, he said, Matthew 5, 27 and 28, Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt commit, I'm sorry, thou shalt not commit adultery, right? Was that said? Sure, it was said in the Ten Commandments, wasn't it? But what did Jesus say? But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. And so Christ is expanding on the spirituality of the law. He also said, you know, if you hate someone, you've become a what? If you hate someone, you've become a, a murderer. That's right. That's right. So do we still have a duty for God's law today? Yes, we do. In Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 13 and 14, there the wise man said, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the what? whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. We might think, that we can, in secret, hide from God, hide our sins from God. I think we had a statement in the last hour, something about, you know, people think they have something hidden, but it's revealed. And God knows it all, friends. And he wants you to come up to the high standard. He wants you to come up to the high standard. Now, there's a text I'd like for us to look at in, in uh, Romans 2.13 now. The question says, who shall be justified or made righteous? And I want you to read this with me, and I want you to be very careful as we read this, because we want to notice exactly what the text says, as well as what the text does not say, okay? It says, for not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be what? Justified. And to be justified means to be what? Made righteous. Thank you. Now, does this text, does it say that by keeping the law, you are made righteous? Does it say that? No, it doesn't say that, does it? If you look at it, it doesn't say that. But it simply says that those who are doers of the law, they shall be justified. It doesn't say how they're justified, but it says those who are justified, they will be doers of the law. There's something about be becoming justified that brings one in harmony with God's law. But it doesn't say by keeping the law, you can be justified. In fact, friends, you can't keep the law to become justified. And we'll see that as we go through. You, that's an impossibility. That's an impossibility. Now, we are seventh day Adventists. Amen? Are we really seventh day Adventists? Are we seventh day Adventists? You know, I, I'll, have to, I'll have to be honest. I'm getting older. And I've worked around machinery, some machinery in different parts of my life that were loud. And I don't hear as well as I used to. So maybe you could help me here. Are we really Seventh-day Adventists? Yes. Amen. Thank you. We believe in the Seventh-day Sabbath, don't we? We believe that all the commandments are important, right? Can you give me a Bible text that would help me to understand that all the commandments are important? What text would you give me? James chapter 2, that's right. Give that man a pen later. So how many of the commandments are important? They're all important, aren't they? Because, friends, they all represent some segment of the righteousness of God, and we need all of it. In James chapter 2, verses 10 through 12, James says, For whosoever shall keep the whole law 
And yet if then in one point, he is guilty of all. For he that said, do not commit adultery, said also do not kill. Now, if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. So speak ye, and so do, as they that shall be judged by what? The law of liberty. And so we have here depicted to us a great standard. It's all the law of God. It's not just part of it. And you know, Jesus summarized the law one day, didn't he? In fact, he, he really quoted what was already summarized in the Old Testament. And that is that we are to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then we are to love our neighbor how? As ourselves. And if we can get that love, friends, then we will keep those detailed Ten Commandments within. But you know, I have a problem today. And maybe you have the same problem. And that is that I have sinned. And you have sinned. And I know you've sinned because the Bible says you've sinned. It says we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now, I want, I want to reach the standard of the glory of God, don't you? But if sinning brings me short of the glory of God, then obedience will bring me to the glory of God. Obedience of love. E.J. Wagoner, in his book, Christ Our Righteousness, on page 54, wrote these words. To justify means to make righteous or to show one to be righteous. Now, it is evident that perfect obedience to a perfectly righteous law would then constitute one righteous person. But for one to be judged a doer of the law, it would be necessary that he had kept the law in its fullest measure every moment of his life. The law speaks to all who are within its sphere, and in all the world there is not one who can open his mouth to clear himself from the charge of sin which it brings against him. And so we have this problem, friends. We have all been condemned to death because the wages of sin is what? Death. Where is that found in Romans? Romans 6.23, that's right. So how can we be justified? How can we be made right from breaking God's law? In Romans chapter 3 and verse 20. Romans chapter 3 and verse 20. It says, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. So, friends, it doesn't come by keeping the law. Paul is emphatic. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. In fact, I think if you look at that text carefully in the Greek, it says, therefore, by the deeds of law, shall no flesh be justified. By no law. Ten Commandments, health laws, sanitation laws. You know, those things are important. They have their place, but friends, we can't be saved by doing them. You know, we have people who believe in righteousness by diet. You know, you eat this, you eat this, you're going to be made good. We have people who believe you're righteous by health reform and dress reform and all kinds of reforms. And friends, the reform we need most of all is worship reform. And if we would get worship reform, we get everything else that we need. But we can't get it that way. Wagoner noted in page 55 of Christ, our righteousness, the law of being holy, just, and good. And we read that in what text? Romans 7, what? Romans 7, 7. Say that again. 7, 12. Romans 7, 12. That the law is holy and just and good cannot justify a sinner. In other words, a just law cannot declare the one who violates it innocent. And that's self-evident, isn't it? So, is there any way that I can be like God or my righteousness can exceed God's? Well, in Psalm 16, verse 2, it says, O my soul, thou hast said unto the Lord, thou art my Lord, my goodness extendeth not to thee. We need God, friends. Our goodness goes nowhere. Our goodness is nothing. Our hearts are naturally evil. In Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse 9, it tells us what the heart of man is like. It says the heart is deceitful above what? All things. 
doesn't leave out much, does it? It's desperately wicked. You know, God, in the way he inspired the prophets to write, he could have just said, you know, the heart's wicked, but he didn't do that. He said the heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? But if you read the next verse, and I don't have the slide for it, but the next verse says, I, the Lord, I try the hearts. I know what's in man. In fact, Jesus knew exactly what was in man. In John chapter 2, in verses 24 and 25, it says, But Jesus did not commit himself unto them, because he knew all men, and needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. Jesus knew what was in man. And he knows the need of man. And he knows how to help man. And he's able to do that. Now, I have a question here. Can the carnal man please God? And by the way, this word carnal, when you see this word carnal in the New Testament, it comes from a Greek word that we pronounce sarx. Uh, we transliterate it S-A-R-X, sarx. And it simply means flesh. It means flesh. Okay. So can the one walking in the flesh or the fleshly man please God? Romans chapter 8, verses 7 and 8 says, because the carnal mind, the fleshly mind, is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be, so then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Now, wait a minute. I have a problem here, Paul. I'm in the flesh. And from what I read in the Bible, I'm going to be in this flesh until Jesus comes. But what Paul's speaking about are those who are controlled or run or ruled by the flesh. And the good news is, friends, we don't have to be controlled by the flesh. We don't have to have a carnal mind because the Bible says, let this mind be you, which was also in Christ Jesus, right? Where does it say that, by the way? Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. That's found in Philippians 2. Five, Philippians 2 5 that's right so continuing with this concept of what our own righteousnesses are it says what is man's righteousness declared to be and that really isn't even the best question because if you look at the verse it doesn't say righteousness it says righteousnesses or it puts a plural on it Isaiah says but we are all as an unclean thing and all our righteousnesses all the plural righteousness that we have all the things that we think are good. It says they are as filthy rags. Filthy rags. And we all do fade as a leaf. And our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. My righteousness is as filthy righteous uh, rag. And so if I have an unregenerate heart, if I have a filthy heart, what can I expect from it? What will come from it? Jesus, speaking in Luke chapter 6, and verses 44 and 45 said, For every tree is known by its own fruit. For of thorns men do not gather figs, nor of a bramble bush gather they grapes. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good, and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaketh have you ever had someone maybe a neighbor or even a family member that just treated you really badly that was just always nasty to you and you wonder why do they have to be like that why does that person have to be like that friends it's just their nature to be like that if they don't have a regenerated heart if they have just a natural heart they are going to be like that and you should expect them to be like that don't expect them to be nice to you otherwise. Well, it seems like a, at this point, it almost seems like we have a, uh, a pretty depressing picture. We have deceitful hearts, desperately wicked above all things. Our righteousnesses are nothing but filthy rags. Out of our evil hearts come evil things. Does the Bible, though, speak about a people who could be righteous? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. In Isaiah chapter 3 and verse 10, say ye to the righteous that it shall be well with him, for they shall eat the fruit of their doings. The Bible indeed does say that there can be righteous people, 
and not just a person here or there, but the Bible speaks about a righteous nation. In Isaiah chapter 26 and verses 1 and 2, it says, In that day shall this song be sung in the land of Judah. We have salvation will God appoint for walls and bulwarks. Open ye the gates that the righteous nation which keepeth the truth may enter in. You know, we read a statement in the last hour that God doesn't respect nationalities, nationalities of this earth. That nationalities mean like nations, people to nations. But does God say he's going to have a nation? And that nation is going to be of black and white, and red and yellow, and all kinds of people in it. Amen. But it says that that nation is going to be a righteous nation. God is not going to take God is not going to take one unfit person into the kingdom of God. Not one. What is this truth that they keep, that this nation keeps, that's going to enter in? In Psalms 119 and verse 142, thy righteousness, we talked about righteousness earlier, right? Psalms not 119, 172, all thy commandments are righteousness. Now here in verse 142, he says, thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and thy law is the truth. The truth that they keep is going to be his law, friends. Now, I want to enter that kingdom, don't you? I want to be a part of that righteous nation, don't you? Amen. Amen. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, Jesus tells us a little bit about who's going to enter that kingdom. It says, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that, what, doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. I think of Paul when he was on Mars Hill in Athens. And he told those people, he said, you know, you're, you're very superstitious. But the Greek word really means just religious. You're very religious. Kenya is a very religious country. I see churches all over the place here. But that doesn't necessarily mean they're Christian. Do you understand the difference? We can be very religious. We can even claim to be Christians, friends. But to be a Christian means to be Christ-like, and Christ was a doer of the law. And he expects his people to be doers of the law. But he understands that we have sinned. He understands that we have come short. He understands that we have wicked hearts. The friends, he wants to fix that in each and every one of you. And he delights to do this but he applies mercy to us. In Micah chapter 7 and verse 18, he says, Who is a God like unto thee that pardoneth for sin? Pardon is another word for forgive. And passes by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage, he retaineth not his anger forever because he delighteth in what? Mercy. You know, I, I've seen little children be given gifts before you know one's given this little gift the other's given this little gift and they look at each other and each one wants to give his gift you ever see that you know one's pulling on one one's pulling the other and and then you say you say well, now now children share share and reluctantly they okay you know god's not reluctant in his mercy he delights in his mercy and the bible in words that are hard for us sometimes to appreciate, describes how great his mercy is. In Psalms 103 and verse 11, he says, For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear them. Fear him. In the time of David, a man could look up into the sky and he could count if he had good eyesight, about 2,000 different stars, about 2,000 different stars. But along came a man by the name of Galileo, and he invented something we call the telescope. And when they looked up into the heavens with the telescope, they realized that there were thousands and thousands and thousands of more stars that they had never saw before. And then came along this thing later on called the Hubble Telescope and now the James Webb Telescope. And these things, they show us heavens that are higher than we can imagine. 
some of those stars that you see at night tonight, for example, some of those points of light that look like one star, they're whole galaxies. And beyond those, beyond what our eyes can possibly imagine, there are galaxies upon galaxies upon galaxies. The heavens, friends, indeed are high, and his mercy is as great as the heavens are high. And he has manifested that mercy in forgiveness of our sins. Continuing there in Psalms 103, in verse 12, he says, as far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. And let me just pause there, and I want you to think about the earth. Here's a picture of the earth taken by some of the astronauts that went to the moon. And in fact, you see Africa, and you might just see right here, Lake Victoria. Isn't that neat? We're not too far from it, are we? So we're just about in the middle of that picture. When I came to your country, I came from the United States, and I had to fly in an easterly direction, right? Now, from where we're at right now, we're near the equator. It's just about the same distance to go to the North Pole as it is to go to the South Pole, right? Yeah. Right? But if I start, if I start right now, and I've got a watch, and this watch, if I put it on the right place, it will tell me, let's see, I'm looking at it right now. I'm turning, turning. Oh, this is north. This is due north right here. This is due south this way. Okay, our building is orientated pretty much north and south, east and west. So if I start going due north, how far can I travel north? How far? To the North Pole. When I get there, if I keep going, what am I doing now? I'm going south. If I start to go south right now, how far south can I go? To the South Pole. When I get there, and if I keep going, where am I going to go now? I'm going north, right. Okay. But now this is east. This is east. If I start traveling east, how far can I go? Is there any stopping to my going east? I can continue to go east as long as I want to go east. Or I can turn around this way and I can go west, and I can go west as long as I want. I'll come right back here, but I can keep going west again and come back here again. I'll keep going west again. It says here, it says, as far as east is from the west, so far as they removed our transgressions from us. I want to tell you something. God knew a long time ago this earth was a, was, was a spherical object. And that's why he said it this way. And then in Micah, going back to Micah 7, it says, he will turn again, he will have compassion upon us, he will subdue our iniquities, and thou will cast all their sins into the depths of the seas. There's a place in the Pacific Ocean called the Mariana Trench. And uh, that part of the sea is over 12 kilometers deep. Can you imagine that? That's pretty deep. He casts all of our sins into the depths of the sea. Now let's open our Bibles or notice on the screen we have a text here from Luke 18. This is the parable of the publican and the sinner. Sometimes we call it that at least. But let's notice the text first. And he spake, speaking about Jesus. And when Luke 18, I'll be reading verses 9 through 14 all together. And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were what? Righteous and despised others. So he's speaking about people who think they're righteous. He says, two men went into the temple to pray. The one a Pharisee and the other a publican. Now, Pharisees, remember, they were like preachers of their day. They were expounders of the law. They were very careful and meticulous. They were like the reformers of their day, friends. They were the conservative branch of the church. They weren't like those Sadducees, those liberal guys. They were the historic Jewish people. And the publicans, who was a publican? What was another name for a publican? Tax collector. Now, I'm sure in Kenya, you love tax collectors, don't you? You just love it when you get a, a, a call from the government saying, we are here from the tax agency and we got to talk to you. I don't think that's probably your favorite idea of a, a good dream. And it wasn't in the days of Christ either. They were despised. They were hated because they were so crooked, so many of them. But it says, the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I'm not as other men are, 
extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I wonder how many times since we've prayed something similar. Oh, Father, I'm glad I'm not a Catholic. I'm glad I'm not one of those filthy politicians. I'm glad I'm not like that adulterer out there. Verse 12. The Pharisee said, I fast twice in the week. You know what he was saying in effect? He said, I practice health reform and I'm a strict vegan. I'm a vegan of the vegans, man. I give tithes of all I possess. And it is important to give tithes, isn't it? In other words, I do it all, man. And the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes into heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful unto me, a what? A sinner. The Pharisee went in and said, I'm a great guy. And the publican went in and said, I'm terrible. I'm a sinner. And he said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus said in verse 14, I tell you, I tell you, I we, we have a dear brother in France, John Christophe Ballot, Pastor Ballot. And one of his more um, used expressions is, I tell you, <laughs> you ever hear I tell you, Jesus said, I tell you, this man went down to his house, how? Justified rather than the other. The publican went down to his house justified. The other guy didn't go down to his house justified. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Now, Back in verse 9, you see the word righteous there? It's highlighted in white. And how, down in verse 14, we have the word justified. These come from the same Greek word. One is simply a verb form. The other is the noun form of the word. Righteous being the noun form, justified, or to be made righteous, the verb form. And so Jesus said those who trusted themselves that they were justified weren't but the one who went down to his house justified was the one that came in acknowledging his sinfulness now maybe there's someone in our congregation today that has not been faithful in their tithes and offerings i'm going to go back to our last speaker and maybe there's someone who's even withheld their tithe for two years like this brother that was in the testimony. I don't know. I don't know. God can be merciful to you, friends, but he expects restitution. He expects restitution. He expects you to make right what you made wrong. You want to be justified, friends? Sure. There's a way. The Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from hot all unrighteousness. But friends, true confession, true confession means a true repentance, a sorrow for sin, and with it, restitution were possible. When I was uh, younger, about 12, maybe 13 years old, probably 13, 14 years old, I was involved with another young man in, in doing, uh, we, we were stealing, we were stealing. And when I became 20 years old, I was a Christian. I became a Christian and I gave my life to the Lord and I asked him to forgive me my sins and good. And a few years later, I got into the ministry and then one week we were going to have an evangelistic campaign. And, you know, I really wanted that evangelistic campaign to, to do something, right? And I'm praying. I said, Lord, is there anything in my life that's not right? You know, anything in my life not right? He said, yeah, there is. You never step that stealing earlier when you were a kid. Remember that stealing you did? Oh, yeah, I do. You know, it had been so long. So many things had happened. I forgot about it. See what I did? I wrote a check out to the people I stole from. I added in some for interest. And I wrote a, an apology note. and said I was sorry that I stole from them. And I wanted to make it right. Because I knew that if I didn't do that, God couldn't bless me. We read that earlier. If we don't do what's right, God can't bless you, friends. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And we need that every one of us because we've all sinned. We've all come short of the glory of God. And we cannot 
we cannot be justified by doing these things, but friends, we won't be justified without them. Does that make sense? Those things of themselves don't justify us. But when we are truly justified of God and we have Christ in our life and his love is reigning in our hearts, we are compelled by the love of Christ to do the right thing, to make restitution, to fix the things that we've done wrong. Because by the deeds of the law, it says, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. You know, even if I said, I'm sorry for, for stealing those things, I can't fix that. I can't fix that. So how then are we justified or made righteous? In Romans chapter 3, verses 24 and 25, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. It says being justified freely through his grace. There's no other way, friends. We ourselves could never keep the law. We can't keep the law of our own selves. We can't fix the past breaking of the law that we have done. But through his grace, we can have forgiveness and pardon. Because Jesus, one was equal with the law, because he was equal with the Father, just as the divine of the Father, to get caught as a ransom for the broken law. And this law says, it will testify, and we'll read that in a minute, but this, this gift that he gives us is really a free gift. In Romans 5, 17, Romans 5, 17, for if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they to receive abundance of grace. Notice he doesn't say it's grace, but what? An abundance. Now, if you have an abundance of something, what does it mean? Fundamentally, what does it mean to have an abundance of something? More than you need. More than you need. In other words, if you've got if you've got three liters of sin, he's got ten liters of grace for you. Okay, he's got an abundance which we receive an abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness. It's a what? It's a gift. The gift of righteousness shall reign in one life by. Shall, excuse me. Shall reign in one, in life by one Jesus Christ. So he says that this righteousness it is a gift to us it comes through grace which is abundance and it's bestowed upon those who believe in romans chapter 3 and verse 22 it says even the righteousness of god which is by the faith of jesus christ unto all and upon all them that what believe for there's no difference he goes on to speak about the jew and the gentile it doesn't matter who you are if you believe now what does it mean to believe again it means to have faith this word believe in the Greek is a Greek word, pistu, pistuo. It comes, or it is, is a root word uh, for the word pistis, which is the word that we translate faith. One is simply a noun form, the other is a verb form of the word. To have faith means to believe. If I believe, it means I have faith. But remember, friends, it has to be a saving faith. The Bible says that uh, you believe there's one God, you do well, right? You all believe in one God? Everyone here believe in one God, right? You do well, right? The Bible says you do well, but it says the devil also believes in what? Trembles. And that word believes is pistuo. It means to have faith. So you see, there's a type of faith, friends, that's a type of believing, an intellectual believing that we can have that doesn't have any power efficiency to us at all. But when we have saving faith, when we have faith that's activated by love and works in our lives, then we have this righteousness upon all who believe. And this righteousness, as I mentioned earlier, is witnessed by the very law itself. In Romans chapter 3, and verse 21, it says, But now the righteousness of God without the law, in other words, the righteousness that comes by grace through faith by Jesus Christ, that righteousness without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. In other words, the law and the prophets can look at this righteousness, can look at this grace, and it says, this is the genuine article. This is the real thing. And it's right. And it's good. And so when, friends, when we are in Christ, we have his righteousness. In Philippians chapter 3. And by the way, if you're ever really down and discouraged, need a place to go to, read the book of Philippians. Read the book of Philippians. Philippians chapter 3, verses 8 and 9. 
Yea, doubtless, and I count all things, but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, you know what that is, that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. The Apostle Paul, who was a doer of the law by God's grace, said, I don't have righteousness by the law, I have it by the faith of Christ. But that righteousness that he had, it constrained him, he said. It propelled him to do the things God wanted him to do. You know, Paul was in a city uh, called Lister one time, I believe it was. And uh, he was stoned and says they thought he was dead. We don't know if he was truly dead or not. They drug him out of the city, but he revived, you know. And you know what he did? Instead of running away, trying to get help, he went back into the city to continue his work. Now, you don't do that unless you love some of friends. It was his love of Christ that motivated him. He understood the depths of his sin. He had been a conspirator to murder. He had been a conspirator of having people cast into prison. And prisons in those days were probably not even as good as prisons that are in Kenya today. But he had the righteousness of Christ because he believed. Now, does this mean God has been unfair or unjust in some way? Is that possible? No. In Romans chapter 3 and verse 26, we read here, to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. God is just in this transaction, friends, because Christ's death on Calvary fully paid the penalty for your sins and for my sins. It fully paid the transgression for every sin that could have ever been committed because he was equal to all of creation. I'll wait just a minute while we make an adjustment here. Thank you. So again, in Romans 3.26, to declare, I say, at this time, his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. So God is fully right. He's fully just in what he's doing. And we who believe in Jesus are made right. In Christ our righteousness on page 63, he says, be made righteous freely, quoting the text. How else could it be? Since the best efforts of a simple man have not the least effect toward producing righteousness. It is evident that the only way it can come to him is as a gift. That righteousness is a gift is plainly stated by Paul in Romans 5.17. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in one life and life by one, Jesus Christ. It is because righteousness is a gift that eternal life, which is the reward of righteousness, is the gift of God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And again, that's from Christ, our righteousness, page 63. We've all probably seen this text in Jeremiah 23, 6. In his days, Judah shall be saved and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is his name whereby he shall be called the Lord, our righteousness. The Lord, our righteousness. He is our righteousness, friends. And he alone is our righteousness. And any time you begin to think that you're good, any time you begin to think that you have something special, remember the Bible says you are nothing but filthy rags. The Bible says that your natural heart is desperately wicked, it's deceitful above all things. But the Bible says that you can have the life of Christ in living in you, Christ in you, the hope of glory. And if there's anything good in my life today, friends, even a particle that's good, it's because of Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. And I come here from a country that many people would, outside of our countries, and I'm not saying I'm saying this, I'm saying what other people might think. They might think that our country is superior 
America superior to Kenya. You know, America has great highway systems. We don't have these bumpy roads that are just terrible to, to drive on that you have. We have a higher standard of living. And both of those things are true. We have overall a higher educated population than you have. And that's true. Friends, that doesn't mean that I as a person from the United States or Sherry or anyone from the United States is any more righteous or better than the poorest, most isolated person in Kenya, Uganda, Nigeria, or anywhere else. We're all one in Christ, friends. It's true. There are people in Kenya who live in a nicer place and higher standard than some of you live. I know that. You know, even within your country, you have these differentials. But those things don't make anyone better. And neither does being down poor and in a poor position make you worse. What does God account? What is the account of worth? What is the account of worth that we learned just a little bit ago? He counts character. It's your character that he counts as worth. And friends, we can have that character, that righteousness of Christ into our lives by believing in Jesus. But friends, when you really believe, and you believe based upon that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, and love begets love, that you're going to want to love him and serve him. And it says in Romans 2.13, those who are doers of the law, they will be justified. And it's not because they're doers of the law that are justified. They're justified through the grace of Christ. But that justification, that love, produces doer of the law. In other words, as Ellen White says in the book Steps to Christ, obedience is the fruit of faith. How much simpler could we make it? Obedience is the fruit of faith. And I just hope and pray that each one will have that faith that works by love and purifies the soul. It's been a real privilege to be able to share some of these studies with you. I'll be moving into another area of study uh, starting this evening. But may God bless you, friends, to draw closer to Christ than you've ever been. To trust in him. Don't trust in the church. Don't trust in a spouse. Don't trust in a child or a parent. Trust in him. Put your full trust in him. You know, in the sanctuary service, I, I think I have time just to say this last thing, maybe. When the sinner came in with his offering, he was to place his hands in confession upon the lamb, and then he would slay it. But when you read the Hebrew and the Hebrew text itself, it says that he was to put his full weight upon the animal. And, you know, you think of a little lamb. When you put your weight upon that lamb, what's it going to do? It's going to buckle down. You're going to crush that lamb. And that's what my sins did to the Son of God. It's what your sins did to the Son of God. But the good news is he ever lived now, today, to make intercession for you. And he's able to save to the uttermost all who come to him by faith. So let's do that today. What do you say? Will you pray with me? Father in heaven, we thank you so much that we have had this opportunity to study about your great standard and the way that we can come to that standard through Christ. And this morning earlier, we were talking about a very uh, sensitive matter to many people and uh, one that is very near and dear to me is one of your ministers, one who has supported by the tithe, one who could be here because of faithful people who are returning tithes and offerings. And we want to be faithful, Father, in this. We want to be faithful in all things. I want to be faithful in my fidelity to my family, my love to my family, my church family, my home family, the larger church family. I want to be faithful to you, Father, in preaching the truth whether it's about tithes and offerings, the Sabbath, the truth about you, whatever it is, I want to be faithful in that. 
I pray, Father, that each one will want that same, that same desire in their lives to be faithful and loyal. Because we're coming to a time our loyalty is going to be tested. And it's going to be tested and some will not love their lives unto the death. Help us to each have that attitude, whether we're called upon to be a martyr or not. Help us each to have that willingness to die, if need be, rather than break your commandments. But Father, today, we understand that of ourselves, we have no strength. We have wicked hearts. We have fleshly minds. We need the mind of Christ. We need your righteousness in our lives. Please bless us this day. Help us to just simply come to you in childlike faith, saying, Lord, I've, I've sinned against you. I've sinned against our Father. Please forgive me for Christ's sake. And Father, I know that you will not turn a deaf ear to such an honest prayer. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.